The Brachiosaurus was about 85 feet long and weighed between 30 and 80 tons. But there's a problem. The nostrils were the same size of a modern day horse's nostrils. Did they suffocate? Or was there a different atmosphere on Earth 6,000 years ago? Learn how the environment of the original creation vastly differed from ours today, and how this allowed men to live over 900 years. It produced huge plants and animals and provided perfect conditions for the growth of the dinosaurs. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years, and now for 16 years I've been doing seminars on creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. And in this session we're going to talk about what the Garden of Eden was like. Why did they live to be 900 years old before the flood came? What was different about that original creation that we're not seeing today? And tell you how you can uh, see, take God's promise that he's going to restore the earth like it used to be. You can be in on that if you'd like. But first of all, this is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. Uh, we live in Pensacola, Florida, about to get hit by a tropical storm here in the next hour uh, or so. <laughs> uh, we've had a couple hurricanes since I've been there. It's not a too big of a deal. But I have three children, one of each. One of each. I got them all married off and the dog died, so I made it and I'm home free. And so far I have uh, four grandkids, and that's God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. Hopefully more coming. Got the whole tribe right there. They all live right around me and they all come over every day. It's wonderful. Got a great family. They all want to serve God with their life. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, by him, talking about Jesus, were all things created. And they were created by him and for him. Jesus created everything. And Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Was that really the beginning? Jesus said it was. The Bible says from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Now, the Bible teaches by one man, sin came into the world, and death by sin. By man came death. Evolution teaches death brought man into the world. The Bible says man brought death into the world. These two, two, two views are totally, totally opposite. And the Bible says Adam was the first man. And he was 130 when Seth was born, and Seth was 105 when Enos was born. We covered all that in the last session. If you go through the Bible and add up the dates, it's not that hard to do. You'll come to a date of about 6,000 BC, or 6,000 years ago, 4,000 BC for the creation. That's the dates you get from adding up the ones given in the Bible. So we're going to cover a couple things now. What was it like before the flood came? Is it possible for a person to live over 900 years? You could learn a lot in 900 years. Many people have never thought of this, but do you realize that Adam spoke every language in the world? Because there was only one, okay? Married to the prettiest girl in the world too, by the way. But uh, things were very different back then. <laughs> Textbooks in school are gonna tell your kids dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Is that true? Well, if the earth's only 6,000 years old, that can't be true. Where do dinosaurs fit in? Well, we'll cover that in a minute. Did dinosaurs live millions of years ago, or have they always lived with humans? They just had a different name for them. They called them dragons. Hmm. What was the original creation like? What did they eat before the flood came? What's it going to be like in the 1,000-year reign of Christ when the Lord fixes things back like they used to be? Where did all the water for the flood come from, and where did it go? And were there really giant people on this earth over 10 feet tall? Well, hang on, we're going to try to cover as much of that as we can here, so let's go. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers. Did you know there are people that scoff at the Bible? I deal with them on a regular basis. I attract them like a lightning rod. <laughs> the scoffers out there, they hate me. I'm trying to be nice to them, okay, but they just don't like me. They don't appreciate this. what a nice, wonderful guy I am. Okay? The scoffers, the Bible says, are going to be walking after their own lust. You know the reason people scoff at the Bible? It's not because of their science. They think it is, okay, but no. They scoff at the Bible because of their lust. They don't want God telling them what to do. That's the bottom line every single time. 
The scoffers are going to say, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. That's an important phrase. We'll cover that on video four. A very important phrase right there. But the scoffers are going to say, The way things are happening now is the way things have always been happening. Uniformitarianism. We don't have time to cover that now. We'll get to that in part four. The Bible says the scoffers are willingly ignorant. Willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. See? The scoffers are dumb on purpose of two things, and here they are. Number one, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. Notice the word heaven is plural, heavens. There's more than one heaven. We'll talk about that in a minute. The scoffers are ignorant of how God made the heavens by his word. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now, there's a strange phrase. How can the earth be out of the water and in the water? But look, it says, the heavens and the earth were made by his word. You know, when God made the universe, he didn't lift one finger. He didn't turn one screw or pound one nail. He just spoke, and every molecule lined up. That's incredible to think about. When he speaks, the waves lay down, the wind quits blowing. When he speaks, the dead come to life. When he speaks, the universe is created. Everything obeys the voice of God, uh, except us. He's having some trouble out of us right now, but he's going to fix that one of these days when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, coming soon to a city near you. Mm -hmm. But the scoffers are willingly ignorant of how God made the heavens by his word, and they're ignorant of how the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. In other words, they're ignorant of the original creation. What was it like? We'll talk about that in a second. The second thing they're ignorant of is the flood. It says, the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This world was destroyed by a flood, totally annihilated. The third thing they're ignorant of is the coming judgment. Next verse says, But the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. See, the scoffers are ignorant of the creation. They don't want to admit God created the world because that would mean he owns it. They don't want to admit there was a flood because, you know, that proves God has the authority to judge his creation. They don't like that idea. And they sure don't want to admit there's a coming judgment. I like that bumper sticker. Said so Jesus is coming, and boy, is he mad. <laughs> That's the truth. Well, sadly, many Christians are also ignorant of what that original creation was like and what that flood did to this world. And so it, because of their ignorance of the creation and the flood, it causes Christians to compromise the clear teaching of God's word. Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. By the way, in Genesis 1, 1, it's heaven singular. Later, it's always heavens plural. When he first made it, it was heaven, one heaven, and then later he divides it up into three slices. First heaven, second heaven, third heaven. We'll cover that in a second. But look at verse 5. It says, the evening and the morning were the first day. Notice that word, the, T-H-E. In English, that is called the definite article. The first day. This is King James Version, which I use and I recommend everybody use if you speak English. I collect other versions of the Bible. I'm not afraid of them, but folks, there have been some very serious changes made in some of these other versions. Many have left out the blood in dozens of places. Many have uh, taken away the deity of Christ. There's some serious changes. Many have taken out over 200 verses. We cover more on that on video 7 about why the King James, but I got down my Revised Standard Version that I got for perfect attendance in fourth grade at the Methodist Church. I was raised in an extremely liberal Methodist church in the Peoria area. Now, not all Methodists are liberal, but mine really was. You know, Our church had two pulpits. It was really strange. They had one pulpit where they read the Bible from, and then the preacher would walk over to the other pulpit where he would preach from. It took me a long time to figure out why they did that, but finally I figured out it's because what he's reading over here is so far from what he is saying over there. I had to separate him into two pulpits, you know. But, <laughs> but I had perfect attendance in fourth grade, and they gave me the reviled substandard perversion of the Bible. And so I got down my Bible collection, and I was going to see what the, how they treated the Genesis story. You know, what differences are there? And it says in the reversed version, there was evening and there was morning one day. Now wait just a minute. What happened to the first day? How many the first days are there in history? One. How many one days are there in history? All of them, any of them, right? Why did they call it one day? And down in verse 8, they called it a second day instead of the second day. Well, I found out the guys who did the reviled version do not believe in a literal six-day creation. And just about every other translation available changes it from the first day to one day. You can check it out for yourself. These people, many of them, believe in what's called the gap theory. 
How many have ever heard of the gap theory before? The gap theory was made up in 1814 by a Scottish preacher named Thomas Chalmers. He said, there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2, and there's millions or billions of years in there. Nobody thought of the gap theory till the 1800s, after it became popular to teach the earth was millions of years old. See, in 1715, 1795, a book was written that said the earth is millions of years old, and Christians, some of them believed it, and said, wow, we've got to make the Bible say that. And so they scrambled with compromised positions, gap theory, day-age theory, progressive creation. We'll cover more on that in a minute. But the gap theory was one of the ones came up with in 1814 to teach that maybe there's millions or billions of years between the first two verses. That's what I was taught when I went to Bible college. That's what the Schofield Reference Bible teaches, too. They say between the first two verses of Genesis, there is ample scope for all the geologic eras. They say there's a pre-Adamite rebellion, and the judgment of Lucifer happened. Now, just a minute. Was anybody here before Adam? Was there a pre-Adamite rebellion? And exactly when did Lucifer get judged and fall from heaven? Hmm. Well, we better see what the Scripture says. Genesis 1-2 says, The earth was without form and void. In Hebrew, that's tohu abohu, which means unformed and unfilled. Without form means without form. And void means void, you know, empty. It doesn't mean destroyed. It just means it's not done yet. That's all, okay? A good book on the table out there. If you want to go down deep, stay down long, come up dry, you can read this one on unformed and unfilled. Or if you want a shorter condensed version, get the one that I wrote about the gap theory. To me, it's one of the most dangerous heresies in the history of Christianity, the gap theory. And it is heresy, okay? This house, for instance, is unformed and unfilled. Nobody's living in it. But it's not destroyed. Unformed and unfilled doesn't have to mean destroyed. Now, there is a verse in Jeremiah that uses the same phrase, you know, uh, without form and void. In this case, the Jeremiah passage is talking about a city that has been destroyed. He looked at the mountains, they trembled, the hills moved lightly, there was no man, the birds fled. This can't be talking about the creation. The birds weren't made till day five. This is not talking about the creation. This is talking about a city that's been judged. This passage has nothing to do with the creation. This house also is unformed and unfilled, okay? The Bible says in Exodus 20, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. What do you suppose he meant by that? This, this is part of the Ten Commandments. He wrote this on a rock with his finger, okay? He don't stutter. It looks to me like he's trying to tell us he did it all in six days. Now, would that include Lucifer? Would that include the angels? That would include everything, wouldn't it? Everything in heaven and earth. The question is not, what does it say? The question is, do you believe what it says? So if somebody says Lucifer fell from heaven before the creation, they already have a conflict with this verse. Exodus 20, 11 continues to say, and he rested on the seventh day. If there's a gap between verse 1 and verse 2, this is not the seventh day. Okay, But all through Scripture, it keeps referring to the seventh day. Exodus 31, it's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. The seventh day. It mentions it over and over, the seventh day. Hebrews chapter 4, the seventh day. So, Romans 5 tells us, By one man sin came into the world, and death by sin. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. By man came death. The Bible's real clear. But if the gap theory is true, and it was a pre-Adamite civilization, and they died when Lucifer fell from heaven, you now have death before sin. A clear heresy. Not at all what the Bible teaches. The Bible says death is an enemy. People say, well, don't plants die? If Adam ate the apple, didn't it die? Oh, you better check, first check out and see if plants are alive. They have no blood, no breath. They wither, they fade. We cover all that on video number seven. Plants are not alive in the biblical classification of things, okay? The Bible says God told Adam to replenish the earth. And the gap theory folks always say, well, see right there, it says replenish. And the word replenish means fill again. Look it up in the dictionary. And sure enough, you look it up in a dictionary and it says replenish, fill again. Well, you better look up at the meaning of the word in 1611 when they translated this. The King James translators came across the word male, which means fill. And they chose the word replenish because back in 1611, the word replenish only meant fill. In 1650, an author named Bacon added a second definition to the word called fill again. It never meant fill again until 1650. You get some old dictionaries, like an 1828 dictionary, you can see for yourself, the primary meaning of the word replenish is fill. The secondary meaning is fill again, recover former fullness, added by Francis Bacon. Okay? 
Here's an 1891 dictionary. The first definition of the word is fill. The second definition is recover, former fullness. In 1892, the dictionary switched the definitions. First one in 1891 is fill. In 1892, the first one is fill again. And the secondary meaning becomes to fill. Huh, what happened here? Modern dictionaries changed it again. 18, or 1989 only shows fill again. They left out what used to be the primary definition of the word, fill. There's a 20, 21st century dictionary, replenish, make full again. See, English words change meanings all the time. When I was a kid, the word cool meant not hot. And gay meant happy. Anybody remember those old-fashioned days? Hmm? Yeah. How would, you quote, how would you decipher this verse here? James chapter 2. You have respect him that weareth the gay clothing. Would you agree that word has changed meanings in the last 30 years or so? And you probably shouldn't say that to somebody today. Wow, you have gay clothing on today. That would not be a good thing to say if you want to keep your teeth, right? Okay. Paul said, I would have come to you, but I was let hitherto. You know the word let used to mean hindered. Now it means allowed. English words change meanings. You see, God promised to preserve his word. He did not promise to preserve our English language. So, okay. In Ezekiel 28, it tells when Lucifer fell from heaven. It says, thou, Thus saith the Lord, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou, Lucifer, hast been in Eden. It talks about him here, all those precious stones and everything. It says, In the day that thou wast created. Hmm. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He said, verse 15, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. We can learn several things about Lucifer in this passage. Number one, he was created. It says so twice. He's not eternal like God is. He was created. Okay. Secondly, he was in Eden. And thirdly, he was in Eden until he sinned. Well, the Garden of Eden wasn't made till day six. So you can't say Lucifer fell from heaven between verse 1 and verse 2 because the Garden of Eden hadn't been made yet. Lucifer was in Eden as a nice guy probably for quite a while. Ezekiel tells us that Satan got proud. He was lifted up. He said, I'm a god. He was lifted up because of his wisdom, because of his riches, because of his beauty, because of his power. The four things that still corrupt people today, okay? Wisdom, riches, beauty, and power, okay? His heart was lifted up. And, but in uh, Job chapter 38, it tells us before this happened, he was one of the sons of God, because angels in, uh, old, sons of God in the Old Testament, five times it's mentioned, it always refers to angels. He said, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth, and all the sons of God, the angels, shouted for joy. Apparently, everybody was excited when God laid the foundations of the earth. Lucifer would have been in this group, and he's excited, wow, God's going to do something on this planet. But when was that? Well, it says when he laid the foundations of the earth. Not when he created the earth, when he laid the foundations. I believe that was day three when he made the dry land appear. It was first created, it was a ball of water without form and void, and then he made the dry land appear on day three, which means angels must have been made on day one or day two. The Bible doesn't tell us, but it had to be one of those two days because everything was created in six days. And Lucifer was created. At the end of day six, God looked at everything and said it was very good. It would not be very good if the devil was running around as a bad guy. Everything was very good, okay? People say, aren't created and made different words with different meanings? No, they're used interchangeably. God said, let us make man in our image, so he created man in his image. I've got in video seven a whole list of all kinds of things throughout scripture. The trees are made, the trees are created. The insects are made, the insects are created. The birds are made, the birds are created. I cover all kinds of verses on video seven about that. The gap theory folks teach us that the first earth was destroyed and the, God had to remake the earth. Uh, John Hagee has a beautiful chart he preaches in front of. He got the first earth was destroyed when Satan fell from heaven and then the second earth. And he said, someday God's going to make a third earth. And it's a good sermon and it preaches good and it's a beautiful chart. He's got a good artist, but it's not scriptural. We're still standing on the first earth. Revelation 21 tells us, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the... First heaven and first earth were passed away. This is still the first one. It got rearranged at the flood a little bit, you know, but this is still the first earth. Uh, Hebrews tells us, he, say, he made the angels to be ministering spirits to those who are heirs of salvation. If you're a Christian, you got guardian angels. 
Mine get to retire early, every about every six months. They say, Lord, can you give me somebody else? Have you seen him drive? Lord, I would like a different one, please. They're going to kill me down there. And here's some things to consider, okay? Number one, everything was created in six days. Number two, Satan was created. Satan was in Eden until he sinned. Eden was made on day six. Angels are made to be ministering spirits for us, so why would God make them millions of years before we get here, okay? Satan rejoiced when the foundations of the earth were laid. The foundations were laid on day three. Everything was very good at the end of day six, and Adam was 130 when Seth was born. And before that, Cain and Abel were born, but no dates are given. So if you put two and two together, you can figure out, you know, Satan must have fallen from heaven probably about 100 years after the creation. He could not have fallen from heaven before the creation. It doesn't fit the other scriptures. 1 Peter 2 tells us, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. 1 Peter 1.20. Okay? So you've got to take scripture with scripture, and that's the only way you're going to fit it together. Gap theory was invented by a Scottish theologian named Thomas Chalmers. It violates many scriptures. It puts death before sin. It has Satan fall before day seven. It has, uh, lot, there are lots of questions you can ask gap theory people if they believe this. Okay, you get my little book about the gap theory if you'd like more on that. The arguments for the gap theory are either extremely weak or wrong or involve adding to God's word. I'm not aware of any arguments for the gap theory that hold up to a real scrutiny compared to scripture. So I got down my living Bible in my Bible collection. And it said, let the earth burst forth with every sort of grass and seed-bearing plant and fruit trees. This occurred on the third day. I read that and I said, yay, we have got a good one here. Until I saw the footnote at the bottom. At the bottom, Ken Taylor put, this is a period of time. Instead of a day, each day is a long period of time. How many have ever heard that idea before? Maybe the days of Genesis are not days. Maybe they're long periods of time. They always quote Psalms chapter 90. You know, a thousand years is like yesterday, or 2 Peter 3, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Well, notice, both of those verses say thousand, not million, okay? And neither of these verses have anything to do with the creation. They're just telling us that time doesn't mean anything to God. See, this is not 2005 in heaven. There is no time there. When somebody says, what did God do before the creation, right away you've got to realize they're thinking about something that's not God. Because the God of the Bible is not affected by time, space, or matter. We are the ones that are locked into time, space, matter. God is not. If God is locked and limited by time, he's not God. So there is no time before the creation. God created time. <laughs> we cover more on that on video 7 also. But uh, See, one of these days... It's going to stop again. There'll be no time in heaven. We sing the songs, you know, when we've been there 10,000 years. Well, it's a great song, and I love it, but uh, it's not scriptural. We're not going to be there 10,000 years. We're just going to be there. No more time. First thing you do when you get to heaven, take off your watch and flip it over to the side. You won't need that anymore. Take out that pocket calendar, toss it over. You won't need that anymore. Never be late again. So before the creation, there was no time. At the end, there's going to be no time. The angel flew by and said, there shall be time no longer. Hmm. Which means, if you really think about it, once upon a time, there was a time when there was no time. Even try to think about that one and your brain will start hurting. But uh, here's the Farrar Fenton Bible from 1903. He said, by periods, God created that which produced the solar systems, then that which produced the earth. Uh, does that sound like Genesis 1, 1 to you? How about verse 5? This was the close in the dawn of the first age. The close in the dawn of the second age. He's trying awful hard to make the Bible say the earth is millions of years old. <laughs> okay. The Bible didn't sell very well, by the way. So you look down at verse uh, 11. God said, let the earth bring forth grass, herbs, and fruit trees on the third day. On the fourth day, he made the sun. Now, if those days are millions of years, that's going to be kind of hard on them plants waiting for the sun to come up, don't you think? Hmm. And on the fifth day, he made the insects, and they pollinate the plants. So if those guys teach the days are long periods of time, you've got a real serious problem here, because now you've got to have plants with no sun and no insects and birds to pollinate them, lasting for millions of years. That's a miracle. Big-time miracle, I would say. No professor of Hebrew will tell you that the days in Genesis mean anything other than 24-hour days. Now, they might not believe that, but that's, they know that's what the book teaches. The book clearly teaches the days of Genesis are normal days. 
They always say, it doesn't the word yom mean, you know, day? Could it mean a long, like the day of the Lord? There is one reference out of the 1,800 times yom is used. It always means a day, okay? There are three meanings of the word day. 24-hour day. Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in the day? That's the daylight portion of the day. And then it says, in the day of the Lord. Now, is that talking about a long period of time, or is that also just one day? I don't know. I think that's just one day also. But certainly when it says evening and morning and the first day, the second day, there is no reason to say these days are anything other than 24-hour days just like we have today. No verses in the Bible where the word yom is used indicate anything other than a 24-hour day. Get the Gap Theory book if you want to go down deep on that one, okay? Or my little booklet, The Gap Theory. James Hutton wrote a book in 1795, and people began to think the earth is millions of years old. Thomas Chalmers the, invented the gap theory to try to fit that into the Bible, and it's been swallowed by Christians ever since. It's not scriptural. And Darwin's book came out in 1859, and by then Christians had already accepted the idea that the earth is millions of years old. And so there was really no effective resistance to the evolution theory when it came out. The Christians didn't even fight against Darwin's theory because they'd already accepted the age of the earth as being billions of years old. That's why I say it's a dangerous, dangerous heresy. Okay? And today, 75% of kids from Christian homes that go to public schools are going to reject the Christian faith, mostly because of this great age of the earth issue, which we covered yesterday. How to prove the earth is not billions of years old. Hugh Ross, of course, teaches each of the days are long periods of time. He's got a, re a website, Reasons to Believe. I debated him for three hours on the John Ankerberg show. He won't do it again. I'll debate him anytime, anywhere. He's an extremely smart man. I'm sure he's a very sincere man, loves the Lord. I wouldn't question that. But he's wrong in what he believes. And just because somebody's nice and smiles and very smart doesn't mean they're right. Okay? <laughs> Compare Scripture with Scripture. Search the Scriptures, okay? See if these things are so. So Genesis chapter 1 says, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Well, what is a firmament? Some people say it must be the dirt, you know, because the dirt keeps the water away from the water. No, it's not the dirt. Read down to verse number 20, and it says the fowls, that's the birds, fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. The birds fly in the firmament. The birds do not fly in the dirt. Okay, the birds fly in the air. So the first heaven is telling us right here is where the birds fly, okay? The scripture interprets itself, okay? Second heaven is where the sun, moon, and stars are. God said, let there be lights in the firmament. Talks about the sun, moon, and stars. That's the second heaven. The third heaven... It's only mentioned once in the Bible, right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Apostle Paul's telling the story about the time he got rocked to sleep, I mean uh, stoned to death, and he said he was caught up to the third heaven. Three heavens mentioned in the Bible. First heaven where the birds fly, second heaven where the stars are, third heaven where God lives. We're going to go up there one of these days, we're going to hear a trumpet blast, doo -doo -doo. Lutherans take off first, <laughs> you know, dead in Christ rise first, and then we're going to take a bite off the Milky Way and... You end up going to the third heaven. Mm -hmm. They're going to be there soon. Okay. Psalm 19 talks about the heavens, plural, declare the glory of God. Heavens. Remember Genesis 1 1, it's heaven singular. Then he divides it up into three slices first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. Heavens declare the glory of God. Verse 7 says, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. Now, wait a minute. Is he telling us there was water above where the birds fly? Psalm 148 says, Praise him, ye waters that be above the heavens. Maybe there is still water beyond outer space. The Bible says the Lord sits on many waters. Maybe this whole thing that we see, this huge universe with all these bazillions of stars, maybe the whole thing is surrounded by water. That's the only verse I've got to back up this theory. But maybe everything we see is all, one, is all inside one of them little glass balls on God's dresser that you pick up and you shake once in a while, you know, and the snowflakes float around, you know. And God says, how you all doing in there? There you go. <laughs> so first, uh, second Peter tells us, the earth was standing out of the water and in the water. Apparently, when God first made the earth, there was a canopy of water or ice above the atmosphere. It's not there now. It all fell down at the time of the flood. But Isaiah tells us, the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. <laughs> Interesting. 3,000 years ago, the Bible said the earth is round. Christians have never taught the earth is flat. 
Some heathens have believed that and tried to blame it on the Christians, but we, we've always known the earth is round. But then it says, he stretched out the heavens. Seventeen times in the Bible it says he stretches out the heavens. Maybe that's why we have a red shift in astronomy. And people say, how did the light get from the stars to here? Oh, you got it all backwards. The Bible says God made the earth first and then the stars. So the question is, how did the stars get from here to there? Not how did the light get from there to here? Cover more on that on video 7. But he stretched out the heavens. Interesting. Today's atmosphere that we're breathing has six layers. Troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, and ionosphere. There used to be a seventh layer. It was a layer of water or ice above the atmosphere. I don't know what it was because it's gone now. Okay, All we can do is make a theory about it. This is called the canopy theory, which says there was a layer of water or ice, probably ice, above the atmosphere. I happen to believe it's probably 10 or 20 inches of ice, super cold ice, suspended by the magnetic field. You know how a magnet can float on top of another magnet? It's called the Meissner effect. We cover more on that in video six. But the Earth could have had a canopy of ice suspended in the magnetic field, which would float it above the Earth. This ice or water would block out UV light, some of it. It would increase air pressure. Today, the air is about 100 miles thick. It would squeeze it all down probably to 10 or 20 miles and double the air pressure on the surface. By the way, when the space shuttle blasts off and leaves all that exhaust behind, it's forming ice clouds and the ice clouds float to the north and south pole and hover there about 50 miles above the Arctic. Ice clouds that are floating, they won't fall. Apparently stuck in the magnetic field, I don't know. But article about that here. Josephus wrote in his book that the Hebrews believed when God made the earth on the second day, he placed a crystalline firmament around it. A crystalline firmament. Probably super cold ice, okay? There was not only a canopy of water above the earth, there was water in the crust of the earth. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. See, most of the water that's now in the oceans used to be in the crust of the earth. Psalm 136 says, He stretched out the earth above the waters. It's not the way it is today. I believe the original creation had a layer of water above, maybe 10 or 20 inches, who knows, of ice probably, and then a layer of air to breathe, probably 10 or 20 miles, I don't know. And then dirt and rocks to stand on, the crust of the earth, which we still have. But inside the crust of the earth, there was water. That's the water that came shooting to the surface when the fountains of the deep broke open. By the way, there is still lots of water in the crust of the earth. Otherwise, you could not have hot water vents shooting up into the bottom of the ocean. If you have hot water squirting up into the bottom of the ocean, where does it have to be coming from? lower than that, doesn't it? Still huge hot water vents in the bottom of the ocean. I think some of that water is still coming out. We cover more on that in the hydroplate theory on video six. But I think the earth today still has cracks where it broke open at the time of the flood. I taught earth science for years. The earth is broken up into plates. There's no question. I've been to the San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault, the Golden Fault. None of them are my fault, but I've been there, okay? There's no question. There are cracks in the earth's crust. And when they move around, Buildings fall down. It's called earthquakes, okay? Or tsunamis happen from the, from the underwater landslides and turbidity currents. There's no question the earth is broken up, and there's no question the plates are still moving. The question is, when did all this happen? Now, the evolutionist will tell you this happened over millions and millions of years. The creationist says, no, all this catastrophe probably started at the time of that flood when the fountains of the deep broke open. That's what caused the fault lines. And the water went shooting to the surface, and it's still here today. I was debating an atheist one time, and during Q&A time, this student stood up and said, Hoven, where'd all the water from the flood go? I said, oh, it's still here. I said, the oceans are huge. There's enough water in the oceans. If you smoothed out the earth, it would cover the earth a mile and a half deep everywhere. I flew back over to Pacific from Australia. I told one of the guys in my office, I said, man, that Pacific Ocean is huge. He said, oh, that's just the top of it. <laughs> what a thought. These hot water vents are proof there's water in the crust of the earth still squirting up. Probably most of it's gone now. It's on the surface. But this canopy of water that used to be there in the original creation would make the whole earth like a big greenhouse. How many know what a greenhouse is? They've got all glass walls. You have to dress in the basement if you live in a greenhouse. Well, scientists are still finding lots of water in space between the stars. There's lots of water out in space. Interesting. Cover more on that later. And they've got a new theory now that says maybe a lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs. A lack of oxygen? Why would they say that? Well, they had a big symposium in 1993. A bunch of scientists got together to study the apatosaurus. 
And they said, folks, we've got a problem. An 80-foot Apatosaurus had nostrils the same size as a horse. How is an 80-foot animal going to get enough air through nostrils the same size as a horse? He'd be sucking so hard trying to get a breath. It set him on fire from the friction from the wind whistling in there. <clears throat> they couldn't breathe. Well, apparently they did breathe because bones of dinosaurs are found all over the planet. Even in Antarctica and Alaska. I mean, dinosaurs lived everywhere, okay? So how could an 80-foot animal get enough air? Well, today he probably couldn't, not to get 80 feet long. But I think before the flood came, they had this canopy of air or of water or ice that would increase air pressure. Plus, they had richer oxygen. You know, when they drill into the amber, how many saw the movie Jurassic Park, you know, where they drilled in to get the mosquito blood out? Sometimes in amber, which is petrified tree sap, they find air bubbles in the amber. When they analyze the air bubbles, they find out they're 50% more oxygen than we have today. Today we're breathing 21% oxygen. Amber bubbles have 32% oxygen. Do you know if you lived in a world with double the air pressure and 50% more oxygen, just breathing would be exciting. Adam would go, wow, that was fun. <laughs> hey, Eve, let's do that again. Ready, go. The earth had more oxygen in the past than it does now. Now, you kids are going to be told in textbooks that the earth had no oxygen at the beginning when life was evolving, called a reducing atmosphere. That is baloney. We cover all that about uh, video four, about how life began. <laughs> could not have evolved with oxygen or without oxygen. But if you double the air pressure and increase oxygen, not only does your hemoglobin take on oxygen like it's supposed to, <clears throat> your plasma will get oxygen saturated, which means you could run hundreds of miles without getting tired. Adam and Eve didn't need a car. They could run to grandma's. Only they didn't have a grandma. Or a mother-in-law, by the way. That's why it was paradise. But, um, <laughs> actually, my wife had a great mother-in-law. But uh, I think before the flood came, <coughs> I think things were a whole lot different. With increased oxygen, you would heal up much faster. How many of you remember baby Jessica that fell into the well in Texas? 18 months old, her left leg slipped down in a pipe, her right leg came up behind her, and she did the splits as she slid down inside an 8-inch steel pipe. She went down 20 feet and was stuck there for two and a half days. They tore up the whole neighborhood trying to get that kid out of that well. It was on the news about every 15 minutes. Remember that? You know, baby Jessica is still alive. When they finally got her out of that well, lots of her body had turned black from lack of circulation. Her right leg was totally black, because it had been twisted around and stuck in her face from behind, doing the splits. One of the doctors said, we have to cut her leg off immediately. Another doctor said, hey, before we cut the leg off, let's just try putting her in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. You know what? Hyperbaric oxygen. They put Jessica in one of these chambers, filled it up full of pure oxygen, and pumped it up to double normal pressure. Within a few hours, her leg turned pink. They restored circulation. They saved her leg. They did have to amputate half of her little toe, okay? They couldn't save that. It beats losing a leg by a long shot. By the way, do you know what you call a girl if one leg is shorter than the other? Eileen. <laughs> Just a little bit of trivia there, okay? Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot chamber in Pensacola, Florida. This one in Pensacola holds 30 people in an emergency. A lot of hospitals are getting these hyperbaric chambers. Does UT Medical Center have a hyperbaric chamber? They do? You know how big it is? Is it one or two or three person or one person? Okay. West Germany is treating stroke patients with hyperbaric oxygen, getting incredible recovery from strokes. In England, they're treating multiple sclerosis. They treat all kinds of diseases with hyperbaric chambers. In India, they're treating leprosy, getting incredible results. Here's a kid being treated for cerebral palsy with hyperbaric oxygen. Doctors have discovered if they add more oxygen during surgery when the person's under anesthetic, only half as many patients get infections and only half as many people get nauseated just by giving the sleeping patient more oxygen. Interesting. There's a chamber in New York that treats autism with hyperbaric oxygen. Hyperbaric uh, therapies use as healing tool grows, article says. Here's a single person chamber. Did you know the Dallas Cowboys have a hyperbaric chamber? Why would professional sports teams want a hyperbaric chamber? Well, because they've discovered their injured players will heal twice as fast. 
See, if you're paying the guy $1,000 a minute to go play with a ball, you want him out there playing with the ball. <laughs> okay, earning his $1,000 a minute or whatever they get. Here's a Zach, somebody from the Dolphins. It says, about three times a week during the season, Zach chills out for an hour or so in a hyperbaric chamber, a 12 by 4 bag inflated with pure oxygen that helps the body heal and promotes a feeling of well-being. Hmm. You can get your own hyperbaric sleeping bag if you want. A friend of mine in Oregon has a hyperbaric chamber. Here's my son running the camera back there and his wife and I at an oxygen bar in Alaska. Not a bar where you drink alcohol. I've never had alcohol in my life, okay? But you sit down to eat lunch and you breathe pure oxygen. You pay them five bucks and you breathe pure oxygen while you're eating lunch. And when you get done, you, man, you feel like going shopping again. It's a conspiracy, I can tell you right now. The whole thing's a conspiracy to get you to spend more money, okay? But then you feel great. My friend in Oregon has a hyperbaric chamber. I was out there. He said, Brother Hovind, would you like to try it? I said, yeah. He put me in there, gave me a book to read, and said, I'm going to shut the door and pump it up to triple normal pressure. They, they use the diving terms. You're going to dive to 90 feet. Well, you're sitting right there in the chamber. You don't go anywhere, but it's like scuba diving to 90 feet. He said, now, <clears throat> I'll let you out in about an hour. I was in there breathing pure oxygen for an hour, reading my book, under triple normal pressure. When he let me out, he said, how do you feel? I said, I feel like running around the world. This is incredible. Now, how many of you old-timers, your get-up-and-go done got up and went? You know what I'm talking about? You know, yeah. <laughs> Most exciting thing you can think of is taking a nap Sunday afternoon, right? Well, man, in the pre-flood world, if they had to double the air pressure and increased oxygen, you would just be full of energy all the time. There's a guy in Japan who started raising tomato plants with pressurized carbon dioxide. You know, plants breathe CO2, not oxygen. His tomato plant grew faster than normal. When it was two years old, it was nine, uh, 14, 16 feet tall and produced 900 tomatoes. They moved it to a shopping center and built scaffolding to hold the branches up. They said, you know, this thing might produce 10,000 tomatoes. This is one tomato plant. It ended up growing 40 feet tall and producing 15,000 tomatoes off one plant. They were, it was a cherry tomato plant, but they were, his tomatoes were coming off baseball size, off of his. A guy in Iowa got curious, you know, why do the birds start chirping an hour before sunrise? He found out the chirping of the birds is a certain frequency that opens up the stomata on the leaf cells. You know, the leaf, if you look underneath with a magnifying glass, it's got these little holes in there that open up to let the CO2 come in. It wakes the leaf up in the morning. Well, he discovered that this frequency is found quite a bit in classical music. So he started playing Beethoven and Bach and Chopin to his cornfield. His neighbors thought, you know, un poquito loco a la cabeza, you know. He's about a half a bubble off a plum or something, you know. But cheese done fell out of his sandwich. Anyway, they thought he was nuts until his corn grew 15 feet tall. He played it to his squash plants and they grew, they grew five squash per leaf instead of one. He played it to his black walnut tree and it grew twice as fast as normal. He, his potatoes got t double or triple normal potato size. His cantaloupe were the size of soccer balls. He called it Sonic Bloom. There's a good magazine called Creation Illustrated. I've got one on the table down here. There are two Creation magazines, regular Creation magazine, that's a good one, and Creation Illustrated, which you can go to my website, just click on the dot to go to Creation Illustrated. They'll send you a free copy to try it. It's 20 bucks a year if you want to subscribe. But if you go to my website, Dr. Dino, you can click on that and get a free copy. It's, there's an article in there in one of the past issues about this uh, sonic bloom, which is really incredible, sitting on the table down here. Sign up for it on drdino.com. I debated Jeannie Scott. She's the president of the National Center for Science Education in Berserkley, California. The National Center is a little bitty storefront building with five people in there. <clears throat> the National Center for Science Education. But I debated Jeannie Scott in a debate, and uh, she said, Dr. Hoven, there are 80 separate layers of coal in the Midwest. She's right. She said, if you look at the amount of coal in the world today, the entire biomass, all the plants of the world today, could not possibly be converted to that much fossil fuel. She's right again. There is so much coal in the world that if you took every tree and blade of grass and bush and squished it, you couldn't make all the coal. There are enormous volumes of coal in the earth. I said, Jeannie, you are right. She said, well, don't you see, Hoven, there had to be an enormous amount of time to lay down all the coal seams. Oh, no, no, no. Right there, she's wrong. You see, she's looking at today's world and assuming that's how it's always been. 
The coal we find in the ground today is a result of that flood which buried the world before the flood when they had lots more trees. There's a coal mine in Montana that is 10,000 square miles of coal up to 200 feet thick. Someone told me a few months ago they've now found a seam 300 feet thick. That's a lot of coal. A lot of coal. And sometimes in coal, human artifacts are found. This bell was found inside a lump of coal. This iron pot was found inside a lump of coal. The sole of a shoe found inside a lump of coal. We cover more on that on video 6 about coal formation. But the Bible says there were herbs, that's plants, over all the earth. It's not that way today. 70% of the earth is underwater, for heaven's sake. Okay, that's not covered with plants. The earth was covered with plants when God made it. Did you know they find leaves in Antarctica? <clears throat> 250 miles from the South Pole, they're finding leaves. There are no trees in the South Pole. 70% of the earth today is underwater. Did you know only 3% of this earth is habitable for mankind? A lot of it's under desert, ice caps, tundra, mountain ranges that nobody can live on. 3% is habitable. What we're seeing today is not what Adam and Eve saw. The Bible says he formed it to be inhabited. That's why he did it. Probably the pre-flood world was, I would just be picking a number and say probably 80% land and only 20% water. The oceans weren't there. They, the water was in the crust of the earth or in the canopy overhead. But there, was, there were trees from pole to pole before the flood came. This layer of water above the earth would act as a barrier that would block out UV light and x-rays and other harmful things that come from the sun. See, the sun produces a lot of stuff besides light. It produces x-rays and gamma rays and beta rays, and all them ray boys come down here, and they're pretty hard on your carcass. X-rays particularly are dangerous. How many have ever had an x-ray before? I broke nine bones growing up. My brother broke 21. <laughs> we played rough in our neighborhood. One of my neighbors shot his brother through the leg with a crossbow. He said, I didn't know it was loaded. How can you not know a crossbow is loaded? Oh, duh. Anyway, you go to the hospital and they say, take off all your clothes and put this little gown on. You put this little gown on, you know, and they say, no, it doesn't quite, it doesn't quite come together in the back. You know, it's kind of embarrassing. And then they say, now walk down the hall about 12 miles and you'll see the x-ray room. Well, if you make it all that way, they'll say, oh, we're so glad you made it. Would you please lay on this table? And they just got the table out of the freezer a few minutes before you got there. How many been on that same table? Now, you know what I'm talking about? It's ice cold. And he puts this weird machine on top of you, and the doctor says, okay, now take a deep breath and hold it. And he runs out in the hall. <laughs> and he's got a lead apron on. You say, Doc, come here. Is this machine dangerous? He says, no, it's harmless. He's lying. You say, Doc, how does this machine work? He says, well, when I mash the button, x-ray bullets come out of that machine, and they're going to go right through your body like a machine gun, and we're going to blow you full of holes, billions of them, little tiny x-ray holes. We're going to actually make a shadow of what's inside your body, which, by the way, is why many radiologists have a negative outlook on life. <clears throat> but we're going to blow you full of holes. But he knows it's dangerous for long-term exposure to x-rays, so that's why he's got the lead apron and runs out behind the lead wall. He don't want to get exposed to those x-rays. But a lot of people don't realize the sun x-rays us every day. We're being x-rayed right now. Now, concrete will stop x-rays and water will stop x-rays, but this roof on this church will not stop x-rays. They're coming right through the roof and right through your body. And you're being x-rayed as you sit there. Not a thing you can do about it. Well, I'll tell you in a minute what you can do about it. But your skin feels the full force of these x-rays. And your body has to fix the damage. I mean, you fix millions of holes in your skin every single day. Millions of them. And after 50 or 60 years, or 70 or 80 for sure, everybody around you starts to notice you are losing the battle for damage control. Your skin begins to wrinkle up. You say, Brother Hovind, I, I, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. Okay. If you don't want to get wrinkled, there are three things you can do about it. Number one, you can die early. <laughs> Number two, you can carry a lead or a concrete umbrella over your head at all times. Do not ever get exposed to the x-rays. Or number three, you can do what Elizabeth Taylor has done. How many have ever heard of Elizabeth Taylor, the movie star? Somebody told me years ago, she's got a hole in her forehead. Every morning, she fills it in with caulk and covers it up with makeup, and it's really tough to see, but, you know, it's top secret, actually. 
But I was at Walmart one time, you know, checking out, trying to, you know, check out a Walmart, and there's all these magazines right there beside me, and one of them had Elizabeth Taylor's picture on the front. She was getting married for the 40th time or something, you know, and I thought, hey, I'm going to check this out. I heard about this hole in her forehead, but, you know, I wanted to see it for myself. So I got my Swiss Army knife out, which has a magnifying glass on it, and I picked up the magazine, and I began staring at her forehead. People are walking down the aisle looking at me. I said, hey, what's the matter with you? I'm just looking at a magazine, huh? Go shop, right? I looked at it for a while, and I finally figured out what the hole was. I was so proud of myself. That lady has had so many facelifts down through the years trying to get rid of the wrinkles. It's her belly button right there. <laughs> hey, go to Walmart. She's probably getting married again this week. You can see her picture on there. You say, well, Brother Hovind, I don't want to get old and wrinkled. I'm sorry. If you get old, you're going to get wrinkled, okay? You might as well get ready for it. But that didn't happen before the flood. The Bible says before the flood came, they lived to be over 900 years old and probably didn't wrinkle. One guy is going around, he claims he's a creationist. He says, now folks, uh, they didn't really live to be 900. They counted every month as a year. They used a lunar calendar, and you have to divide those numbers by 12. Wow, that's an even bigger miracle. Enoch was 65 when he begat Methuselah. Two of these guys are 65. Let's see, divided by 12. That makes him five and a half when he became a daddy. <laughs> I doubt that real seriously. Okay. I'd have a hard time believing that. No, they really were living to be 900, and they got bigger. Here's me by Robert Wadlow, tallest man in this century, 8 foot 11 and a quarter, had a size 37 shoe. Pretty big boy, okay? Robert Wadlow would have been just a few inches shorter than Goliath, who was about 9 foot 5 or 6. Robert Wadlow, at age 12, was the world's tallest Boy Scout. Here he is, age 12, with his Boy Scout troop. We would consider that gigantic at almost nine feet tall, wouldn't we? But I think uh, before the flood, they got even bigger than that. Here's a skeleton of a man, 11 foot 6 inches tall. Well, long, not tall. He's laying down now. 11 foot 6. How would you like to have one of those guys on your basketball team? Well, UT would be the champs from now on, wouldn't they? 11 foot 6. Now, sometimes the women get upset with me, and they say, Hovind, you said that was a skeleton of a man. Maybe it was a woman. Well, I taught biology and anatomy, okay? I happen to know how to tell the difference between a male and female skeleton. It is not the number of ribs. Only Adam was missing a rib, and only for a short time. Because there's only one bone in the human body that will grow back if you take it out. Your lower rib will grow back if you remove it. You know, lizard's tail grows back if you cut it off. The lower rib will grow back if you take it out. Well, you'd almost think God knew what he was doing if you didn't know better. But anyway, there are two ways to tell the difference between a male and female skeleton. One way is to look at the feet. If they're pointed toward the mall, it's a woman. <laughs> the other way is to look at the process on the temporal mandibular joint. If that joint right there is worn out more, <clears throat> it's a woman. <laughs> One lady said, that's because we have to tell you men everything twice. You don't listen first time. <laughs> guilty, guilty. Tallest man today, it was 8 foot 4 when this picture was taken. I've been told he's now 8 foot 7, living in Ukraine. Pretty good sized boy. 8 foot 7. Big hands. There he is trying to use a cell phone. <laughs> That'd be tough, wouldn't it? <laughs> Roman Emperor Maximus was 8 foot 6 2,000 years ago. Where we get our word maximum from? A 9 foot 8 inch skeleton was found in Indiana. Two skeletons 9 feet tall found in Virginia City. Every skeleton found in this mine, in, uh, I mean, in this burial mound in Louisiana, 20 skeletons were found, all of them 9 feet tall. Skeleton 10 feet tall, found in Humboldt Lake, Nevada. And in Guam, they have a legend that the giants used to live on the island of Guam and built these big latte stones over there. In Indiana, eight giants were found, ranging from 8 to 9 feet long, wearing heavy copper armor. The museum was not interested in them. Why would a museum not be interested in nine-foot skeletons to put on display? Could it be that there's a theory called evolution which says we started off small and we're getting bigger? Which makes us feel important, of course, you know. We're evolving. Ye shall be as gods. You're getting better. Could it be the truth is exactly the opposite? People were much bigger before the flood and now we're getting worse? And maybe they're trying to hide that? A 12-foot skeleton found in Lompoc Rancho, California, Another 12-footer found in Tucson, Arizona. The guy had six toes. 
six fingers, six toes, and a bird-shaped headdress. When the Mexicans, Cortez, went to uh, Mexico and conquered part of it, the people who lived there said, oh, there used to be giants that lived on this continent. They brought a bone of one of these guys out. Just the thigh bone was as tall as Cortez. Just the thigh bone. And he said, I'm a man of good size. He said, I'm a good-sized guy, and this was the same size as me. This is a giant block of rock. Who on earth is moving these things? Consider that's a camel in front of it for scale. Who's cutting and moving these things? This is a 39-pound axe head. Swing a 10-pound sledge for a few minutes and see why I'm wondering who's swinging a 39-pound axe head. This is a stone designed to be held between the thumb and finger for chipping. The Smithsonian is responsible for hiding most of the discoveries of giant humans. They don't want people to know about these giants because it goes against the evolution theory. This skull used to be on display in Winnemucca, Nevada until a few years ago when they took it down. It's in the basement. You have to specially ask to see it. A giant human skull. Here's a normal human thumb bone. Underneath is a giant human thumb bone. This is part of a skeleton found in a grave in Turkey right near Mount Ararat. The government of Turkey says they have found the grave of Noah. The skeleton was 12 feet tall. Now that would make his cubit a little bigger, wouldn't it? People say, one man and three boys could never build a boat that size. Huh, you didn't see those boys. Hey, Bubba, bring me that tree, would you? <laughs> sure, Dad, where do you want it? We've got a replica of a thigh bone in our museum from a guy that would have been about 13 feet tall. If you meet a guy like that, call him Sir. There's an article on the table all about it down here, if you want to read more on this one. These jaw bones are on display at a hotel in Turkey, six and a half inches across the TMJs. Any one of you could put your head inside the jaw and bounce it around. In uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin, they found a human skull three times the size of ordinary humans, found in an Indian burial mound. Giants were on the earth in those days. As the Bible says, there were giants here. Well, the Bible says we're made in God's image. Now, if we're made in God's image, why do we pay to teach the kids that this is Grandpa? What is the truth about the cavemen? Where do cavemen fit into this picture anyway? I mean, if the Bible's true and the earth's only 6,000 years old, what about the cavemen? Well, we'll cover that after a quick break. Cavemen, coming next. <laughs>